Hello Internet, Seth Skorakowski, and today we'll be talking about the Traveler Adventure Search and Rescue, appearing in 2023's March's Adventures 1 through 5, a collection of five scenarios by Martin J. Dowtry and Chris Griffin, including updated versions of High and Dry and Mission to Mithril, which I've previously covered. While the scenario comes in at 40 pages, the bulk of that is going to be settings, NPC profiles, and equipment. The actual adventure portion is about 17 pages. And technically, yes, this could be completed in a single session, but I feel that Game Masters should really take their time with this one, because it's not as much of an adventure, but a mini campaign that's set over the course of several months, or maybe even years, with the adventure portion being the big finale to that. Now, while the travelers don't need their own starship for this adventure, they are going to need the skills to crew a starship, say for jump and astrogation, they're not going to need those. And while technically the only book that you need for this adventure is the core rulebook, because a lot of the spacecraft options that you'll find and all the different systems that are going to be used in it, I strongly recommend that you have a copy of Highguard at hand. The travelers are hired to operate a really cool 400 ton search and rescue craft in a remote red zone system. They're given access to all kinds of high tech tools and equipment that they normally might not have access to. Now, during their contract, they might be repairing sensor buoys, rescuing damaged ships, battling pirates, maybe uncovering some corruption in the system, and of course the actual adventure itself. I think it's a really cool scenario, and with all the details that I added that I'll be going into, it took us about 15 hours to complete and served as a good primer and springboard as an opening for our Traveler campaign. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer my tips and suggestions and a few criticisms as a game master who has successfully run this adventure. Hey, and I'm Jack the NPC. I'm going to give it to you from a player's side of things as I get to rescue spacefarers from the biggest threat in the galaxy, themselves. But first, a word from today's sponsor, Second Dynasty, and their coming Kickstarter for 3D printable Traveler Small Craft. I've talked about Second Dynasty before when I reviewed their Traveler 100 ton Type S scout ship that was scaled to 28mm miniatures. Then last year they upped it by creating a 200 ton free trader that they launched their Kickstarter. Well, this year they're changing it up, and instead of offering a single ship, they're releasing a collection of four small craft from the Traveler universe. They sent me one of their prototype 20 ton launchers. Launches. Now, I haven't painted or glued anything here, it's simply held together with clips, and I was able to put it together in just a couple hours. It has sliding doors, including the cargo doors for both a main and a lower cargo area. The loading ram can slide in and out. Now, I'm showing the miniatures in here for a sense of scale, but these miniatures also come from Second Dynasty, by the way, and they can be picked up as add-ons. Now, as I've said, this is a prototype model that I have. They've made a few tiny tweaks to the final version since then, so the final kicks starter one is going to fit together even smoother than this. Now, this is only the ship's launch. They're also doing a ship's boat, which is a little bit longer and has a passenger compartment. Then there's a modular cutter as well. And the one that I'm looking forward to most is a 40-ton pinnace, which in addition to a rear patch with extending ramps and working folding wings, I mean, what game master out there wouldn't want to whip this out on their table and have all their players go, ooh, nice pinnace. The Kickstarter begins October 4th, so just hit the link below. Stretch goals include alternate noses and engine modules, a civilian gig, a slow pinnace, a 10-ton slow boat, and a variety of cutter modules. And because not everybody out there has access to a 3D printer, there will be a limited number of pre-printed small craft that are available to order, and they stress to me that it is going to be a very limited number here, so you're best to act fast. Now on a personal note, Second Dynasty has told me that their traveler ship line hasn't been as popular as they'd originally hoped, so unless this Kickstarter does well, it will be the last of their licensed traveler ships. And for my own selfish reasons, I need them to do well on this thing so they continue uh, making more and hopefully eventually will bring me a far trader. So when anyone out there it's on the fence if they should join this Kickstarter or not, then you know do it for me because then I can guilt trip them into making me my far trader. And maybe one day in the future I can get my subsidized merchant ship. But thank you for the launch second dynasty and anyone out there who's wanting some 3D ships for their tabletop role-playing gamer just to play with because they're really cool, you should definitely check out their Kickstarter. Links below. Okay, now back to the video. But first I must warn you that there will be spoilers. So any players in the audience, please stop here. But send your Game Master this way to see about running the adventure for you. But if you keep going and you spoil yourself, no one will rescue you when your jump drive inevitably fails.
Okay, Game Masters, let's do this. The adventure takes place in the Goram system, which is in the Spinward Marches, but that can be easily moved to fit your campaign. The planet is home to a small primitive population that's only recently achieved Tech Level 2. Now, to preserve the population for study of their development, the world has been declared a red zone, making it illegal for anyone to go there. However, because the world is also along the Spinward main trade route, ships will need a stop in the system to refuel, so Goram Station was built as a means of policing the system system, making sure that no one visits this planet or even gets uh, within sight of the planet. That way the locals don't see spaceships flying around there and you know, kind of have their, their progress change because of it, but also serve as a repair and refueling station that's outside the gas giant. The travelers are hired to crew a 400-ton Garrus-class rescue vessel owned by the station. Which is a badass ship. I mean, because this thing ain't jump capable, that means that they ain't spinning any of that room on giant fuel tanks and jump drives. Instead, they have packed all 400 tons with some of the greatest stuff out there. I mean, we're talking about thrust four, four turrets, two bridges, improved census suite, breaching tubes, multiple armories, two brigs, med bays, tow cables. I mean, this ship has got everything. I mean, well, everything but a jump drive, that is. But the best part of the whole thing is, we ain't got to pay maintenance and mortgage on it. I mean, in fact, they're paying us to fly this sweet ship around. Pretty sweet deal. I love this ship, though many of the features you will need the High Guard book to get their full descriptions. Now, the module says that the travelers are under contract to fly this ship for a certain amount of time, but it never states what that contract's length is. Now, for my game, I decided that'd be six months, but other game masters can make this a year, four years, as if this was the, the, the final term of their character creation as they're actually working the search and rescue ship. Now, the module suggests that the reason that the travelers took this job is because they want something, such as to keep themselves out of jail or to get something out of this system, and taking this contract was a means to that end. Now for my game, the characters had received a ship when we were doing character creation for our campaign, but they wanted to make some pretty heavy modifications to that ship. So what I decided is while their ship was going through this big refit to get all the stuff that they wanted done to it, they went ahead and they picked up this Gorham contract as something to do during that time. The module goes over all the stuff the characters are expected to do and all the positions that they can take take, as well as those salaries, but instead of me simply just telling all this to my players and hoping that I didn't miss anything or they didn't forget anything that I did tell them, I summed this all up in a handout that I made to look like their contract, which really spells everything out as far as the job. Seth has given us countless handouts over the years, but for whatever reason, giving us an actual contract that we had to sign was one of his big hits. So he gives each of us one of these things, we had to look it over or figure out what all of our positions were and what that pay was going to be, then we signed it as our character and gave it back to him, and he signed it as the station manager and gave it back to us. And it served as a really great way of laying out and reminding us exactly what our responsibilities were. I stuck a link down in the video description below if any game masters out there want a copy for their own game or use as inspiration for making their own. Arriving at the station, they'll meet Sar Aelin, the station's XO, and the traveler's main point of contact during their time here. They'll also meet, or at least maybe their only chosen team team leader will meet the station commander Crix Darrison, who's pretty hands-off with the day-to-day -day operations of the station. After that, they'll be assigned their ship, which didn't have a name, so I named it Rescue One, and they're going to have to perform all their trials and inspections on it before they can take it out, which the gr station greatly needs them to get this done as soon as possible because other people here have been you know, taking double duty waiting for Rescue One's crew to arrive. The module doesn't say how long each of these trials should take, so I decided that you know eight hours per attempt meaning that if you divide all this out, it should take at least two days to complete them all. Oh yeah, because before you check out how well it can fly, you should probably check out you know, how the power plants work, its maneuver drives, and its general space worthiness. There is an order of operations that's worth considering. On a success, they'll learn a little bit about that component, but on a success with an effect of four or higher, gleans a little bit more information about it, such as certain equipment needs restocking or replacing. Now what's going on is the station commander has been skipping on a lot of the costs around the station, doing the barest minimum possible, or extending out the periods between required maintenances, you know, taking longer and longer between them. Or if a resupply is ordered, you know, people are only receiving a half stock of uh, goods, he's only ordering half of it. And anyone who complains 
complains about this is just accused of not being a team player. Now, many of the station crew have become frustrated while others have left because of an increasingly toxic work environment. However, because the station commander isn't embezzling or actually breaking any rules, at least no rules that anybody would be able to prove, there's nothing that anyone can do about this. Also, because the station has been saving a ton of money as a result, it's been coming in under budget every month, and everybody's been qualifying for monthly bonuses, so no one's really complaining too much about it. This is one of those areas where game masters have to be a little bit careful in how they approach it. You know, you want to give them enough information that they can figure out that something might be wrong, and they roleplay it, and they kind of start figuring out and looking around. So, you know, game masters have to give them something, but you don't want to come right out and just say, hey, this is what's going on here. Now, for our group, when we met the station commander for the first time, he uttered the phrase, we're like a family here. And that was all we needed to know, that this place was going to be toxic as hell. So to help cover all these rumors and everything at the station, I added a small cast of NPCs that are working here. I also stole a bunch of pictures from other modules so I could give all of them portraits to show to my players. Some of them had a weekly poker night that the player characters might get invited to, and I also decided that the player characters essentially, essentially spent three weeks out and then one week back at the station, meaning that we could break this up over the course of several months as they get a little bit of information, some juicy gossip, and they go out on patrol for a few weeks, come back, go to the poker night, get a little bit more. I also listed out some information of rumors that they could learn through carouse and gambling roles, or just simply role-playing it out. While they're on deployment, they can have several events happen to them, some of those exciting, some of those routine, and I outlined a few minor events, including you know, some excuses to really inform the players about NAY codes, DINDY codes, GK signals, and the like. You know, that way is a lot more kind of a fun learning experience than me just info-dumping that on them. Then we had some major events, like rescuing a crew who had a catastrophic drive failure, and several of the crew and passengers are trapped aboard this ship. They'd lost pressure in some of the passageways. A crew member was pinned under some cargo and it was kind of drifting toward a gas giant. And there was also a pirate attack on another ship, so the player characters had to chase down a pirates before they could get to jump distance, capture the crew, recover the stolen cargo, and then tow the vessel back to the station. And it gave them a really cool chance to use that sweet ship and its weapons and, you know, get a little bit of action in. It also gave Seth the chance to finally use his Model Type S scout ship in an actual game session as we got to clear that thing room by room of pirates. What's weird is we were already planning on bringing that up before Second Dynasty came by and offered to sponsor this video, so that worked out pretty nice. Hey, and while I got your attention, you should check out Second Dynasty's Kickstarter they got going on for Small Craft. Game Masters wanting a copy of my outline notes for all the stuff that I added can find those in the video description below. Now, I wrote these out for me in order for me to run the adventures. They're probably not the most user-friendly for anybody else, but hopefully some Game Masters out there might find them useful for making their own. Now, all of this was really just the first session and a half, and it was just establishing the setup of getting them familiar with the ship and the equipment and all the terminology and some of the other stuff going on. Now, Game Masters were wanting to just make a, a short adventure out of all this, could skip everything that I've talked about so far and just tell their players, you know, this is what's going on, this is what you've been doing for the past few months, and this is the situation, and then start the adventure as they receive the Amishi's Distress Call, which is the actual adventure itself. So what's happened is a modified luxury subsidized liner called the Amishi has worked out an under-the-table deal with the station commander to get the necessary codes that allow the ship to enter the red zone planet undetected. They then carry a lot of rich passengers down to this forbidden world on a tour, take some pictures of Board a wreck sailing vessel that's on a remote island that's, you know, got to be beautiful for all their pictures. And then they've been doing this for some time now, and no one's been the wiser about it. However, on this particular trip, a team of hijackers have infiltrated the crew and the guests, and they have this plan to make off with a ship while no one can track it, while it's got these uh, do-not-detect uh, signals going on with it. Then they're going to jump away and ransom off their wealthy hostages, and maybe even sell off the ship for a small fortune. Unfortunately, one of the guests noticed some suspicious behavior, and they tried to warn the captain about that. The panicked hijackers sprung their trap earlier than planned, and a small bloodbath ensued. Uh, the pilot got hit, and the Amishi lost control and crashed into the planet. However, before he died, the pilot managed to activate the distress beacon. Holy crap, guys, we got a distress call that we gotta answer. It's coming from... Huh. I can't tell where the distress call is even coming from. 
Because the ship is using the do not detect codes, the distress signal is only coming from the system sensor buoys and not from the ship itself. Now a comms check on this garbled signal can figure out that the ship has impacted a planetary surface, but it says that the ship is a free trader and not a liner ship. And a really good role here can glean some more information, including that there have been casualties, shots fired, and even the ship's location on the planet. Okay guys, I got good news and I got bad news. The good news is that I figured out where that distress signal is coming from. The bad news is that it's coming from that red zone world. So if we ignore the distress call, we're breaking in a stellar law. But if we go down to that red zone world, we're also breaking in a stellar law. So what do we do here? I say we call up above because this decision is a little bit above our pay grade. Commander Darrison, worried that this downed ship is the one that he sold the codes to, panics, and he really isn't very helpful to the traveler's calls, eventually cutting radio communication and stops returning their hails altogether. If the travelers still don't know what to do, then the XO comes on, assuring them that the law allows them to enter the red zone for emergencies and orders them to do their jobs. Now, Game Masters, be sure that she advises them here that, that reminder that they still need to take steps not to get spotted by the local population. Okay guys, you heard the lady, let's get down there and save some lives. Once they can figure out exactly where on the planet they even are. If they didn't get the Amishi's location from a great initial comms check, they can get that some, several other ways. Now maybe they can reanalyze the data that they got to get a little bit more information out of it, or hack one of the comm relay satellites to figure out where this distress signal is coming from, or at least narrow that down to a searchable area. Their ship has improved sensors, so maybe they can do some high orbit sweeps looking for the thermals or magnetic signatures, or uh, maybe chemical analysis because the fuel tank's ruptured. Game Masters should apply any mod modifiers for clever ideas that their players have, and then roll 2d6 to determine their chance of being spotted by the planet's population. Now the module never states what the target for this role is, only the modifiers for it, but given how extreme these modifiers are, such as a stealthy approach with extreme concealment measures is still a minus three, I assume the target for this is just a zero. We're trying to determine if we're above or below. Now this is one of those areas where players might try to take the time with it in order to make the skill rolls easier you to do, which is something that travel allows you to do. However, this is also a rescue mission and time is of the essence, so they ain't got that much time to lose. Also, that Jack Station Commander, if they do take a long time to do it, he might just throw them under the bus in order to deflect the blame away from what it was he did. Now, this role only determines the chance of being spotted by the locals, and the effect of that role, either positive or negative, is then applied to a second role, which determines what sort of effect this might have on the planet's primitive culture. Now, of course, the travelers aren't going to know the results of this role until well after the rescue is completed, and scientists have had a chance to go down and study the population to see if anything has changed about them. The Amishi crashed in an island bay, its nose is submerged and taking on water. The travelers can get inside through various ways, some are more dangerous than others, and some are pretty obvious while others not. Now one potential issue here that game masters should think about is the rescue ship's pilot. In theory, they should just remain aboard the rescue ship, you know, hovering around and eventually picking up any survivors that the travelers find. However, it ain't too exciting in a game where everybody else is running through a listing and sinking starship and blasting open doors with specialized charges and rescuing survivors from flooding rooms and fighting off desperate and murderous hijackers while you're just sitting in a starship somewhere else occasionally making a piloting role. You know, some players, they might really like that. And if that's what you got, then great, let them have it. But most players, eh, they want to be where the action is. So Game Masters, maybe you can have some sort of uh, different computer programs aboard the rescue ship that allow it to fly itself, you know, hovering outside the wreck site and feeding any sensor data to the traveler's heads up displays. Or better yet, you could have a, an NPC pilot that's aboard the ship, maybe a living one, maybe a robot, who could then, you know, man the controls and let the players go inside the wrecked ship and do all the exciting player stuff and let the NPC handle all that piloting. Once they're inside, the ship is four levels. Well, only three since the bottom deck is only fuel tank. The ship is on security lockdown, so hatches are locked without an authorization pass key, meaning that the travelers are going to have to hack, cut, or blast these doors open with special charges that they can find on their equipment until they can find a master pass key. Once they're good and deep inside the ship, you know, the ship might shift or, you know, on the rocks, either requiring them to catch themselves, or maybe one of the fuel tanks is going to rupture on one of the rocks, spilling tons of freezing liquid hydrogen into the surrounding water and turning it into ice, which, you know, maybe 
maybe that'll slow down the sinking of the ship, or maybe that ice will start crushing the hull and letting more water in, you know, heightening the stakes and forcing the travelers to act quickly in rescuing all the survivors. Now, speaking of survivors, the module gives us a list of the passengers, their personal staff, and the ship's crew. It comes to 16 people. Now, for whatever reason, most of the personal staff are not even named. They're simply called bodyguard, steward, and personal chef. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, this is a bunch of rich jerks who think that the law don't apply to them, so they're going down to a red zone world in order to get a bunch of Instagram photos to show their friends back home. So to them, their servants aren't even people. They're just nameless things. Regardless of the reason, I found this bit of the module a little confusing for me. We've got pictures of all the survivors, save for one, and we'll get to him in a bit. And then we have locations for the survivors. Now, one of them is Yenefi, who on the list of passengers is just as a nameless steward, so so it made it difficult for me to remember who she even was. And even in the description events in that timeline, it only refers to her as Sua's personal steward when the module could have just simply used her name to avoid any confusion. The way the module is written with what happened during the failed hijacking and how those events transpired, I found it needlessly difficult to follow. You know, a couple read-throughs before I really could get this down, and it's split across several pages with a couple pages in between them, so it's not all nice and neat in one place. Next, there's there's only two hijackers that are still alive by the time the travelers arrive. One has a shotgun and the other has a hidden knife. A shotgun? Holy crap! The suits that they issued us for this adventure give 14 points of armor. And shotguns? You double armor value against them to represent that they don't have good penetration, meaning that I got 28 points of armor versus their little 4d6 damage shotgun, meaning it is going to be near impossible for those guys to even scratch me. So Game Masters, what I suggest you do is mark the map not only where all the survivors are when the travelers arrive, but also name all of the passengers on the ship, and then note on the map where the bodies of the dead are. That's going to make it so much smoother when you're actually in the act of running this, if you just note where all the bodies are, because the rescue team is going to want to go through and collect all of the bodies. Next, I added two more hijackers who were passengers in the unused aft starboard suite. And because I knew the player characters are going to be stomping around on this ship, and that badass naval rescue suit armor that the, the module gave them, I gave those hijackers some beefier weapons. One of them had a laser carbine and another had an SMG. Giovanna is our hidden enemy. She won't appear armed at first unless the travelers really look close. Now she might try to pass herself off as an innocent victim and try to escape, you know, maybe return at some point later on in the campaign as a future villain, so I suggest that you drop some clues that the travelers might discover that she's actually one of the hijackers. You know, maybe one of the, the dead victims that they find they've had their throat slashed, but none of the known hijackers had a knife, so they have to figure out like who cut their throat. Or maybe Stev and Alex they can say that they were hiding and they heard some of the hijackers talking, how there's only four of us left. And then once they discover Martin and the two other hijackers, which, you know, the ones I suggest adding because the module itself only had Martin here, the travelers can then realize that one of the survivors is secretly an enemy because they've gotten everybody off the ship, but they only found three hijackers that were still alive. I also decided to give Chiyo Anna, a laser pistol weapon implant that she could reveal once she realizes she's been discovered and get a little bit of action out of her. Now for our game, once we figured out that one of those people that we had rescued and was back at our ship drinking hot cocoa and wrapped in a blanket, that they were really one of the hijackers, that led to some interesting role play as we started taking them off one at a time and interviewing them and asking them all the questions, trying to figure out which one of them was lying to us. So that's why we recommend that Game Masters put that little bit of work in beforehand to name all the NPCs and figure out where the bodies are and who killed who and the timeline of events. That way they can focus Focus all their attention just on the role play of it as the players get to figure out who done it. Now the last survivor is a minor noble named Sir Paul. He's the most high profile passenger that's on the ship, but for whatever reason the module didn't provide us with a picture, or stats, or character profile for him. So for my game I stole one of the NPC portraits from one of the other adventures in this book and gave that for him. Anyway, during the hijacking, Sir Paul took charge and he tried leading the passengers to safety. But as he was fighting to get the bay doors open to get the ship's launch craft out, Marin Sua shot him in the back and Sir Paul fell into the frigid water below. He ended up swimming 
swimming off to the wrecked sailing vessel that's out there, and he activated his personal distress beacon before passing out. So when the travelers first arrive at the Amishi, and they're trying to figure out how they're going to get inside this thing, they should receive his distress signal saying that there's an Imperial VIP off of this rotting beach sailing ship, and death is imminent. Okay guys, what do we do here? This huge starship with God knows how many people aboard is sinking, and we better act fast if we want to save them. Do we save all of them, or do we save a single rich jerk aboard a busted sailboat? Game Masters, I recommend that you present this with consequences attached. So if the travelers head straight to the Amishi and they're planning to get to Sir Paul later once they've gotten everybody out of that ship, he should succumb to his injuries and die before they get back to him. And then the record of his personal beacon that's reporting his death, you know, that might get used later against them in uh, any inquiries that happen. However, if they all head off to Sir Paul first, maybe have something happen at the Amishi before they can back to it. Like an explosion in the engineering deck, you know, takes out that emergency hatch that's along the top, but now they need to find a less obvious way to get inside of it. Or maybe one of the hiding passengers that's inside, they get a hold of a radio and they're all like, help, help, someone's trying to kill us. And then there's a shotgun blast followed by silence. You know, something that shows that had they not all gone off to one direction or another, they missed out on saving a life or, you know, had a, had a much more difficult time trying to get inside the Amishi. Now, the answer that my players came up with when I did this was they split up. So the rescue ship headed off to the Amishi while one of the player characters attached themselves to their sweet rescue drone and flew over to where Sir Paul was and saved him. Now once the travelers rescue all the people and get out of here, the adventure is done. Hopefully they can figure out who all the hijackers were, otherwise some of them might escape. And maybe they'll get the information to either report Commander Darrison for selling the codes or maybe blackmail him, you know, instead of turning him in. Either way, they're going to earn him as an enemy. They also might leave Sir Paul off of the report, which is going to save his family the embarrassment of a scandal and earn themselves a grateful contact with him, but that's really all up to the travelers. Overall, I really did enjoy this adventure, but it took a great deal of work for me in order to run this. I absolutely love the rescue ship and the sh setup of the travelers all working on this remote station out in the middle of nowhere. There's this commander who's doing some shady dealings. That is my favorite part of this whole thing. But the module really doesn't give us enough here, like a, a cast of station NPCs or encounters. Like, you know, my adding the urgent rescue of a busted free trader and then uh, another uh, incident where they're battling pirates. So Game Masters, you are going to need to flesh this portion out. I also really dig the adventure of the Amishi. However, the timeline of events and the NPC information is all laid out really weird and spread across multiple pages and really isn't that easy to reference in game. So we've only got two bad guys and one of them has a kitchen knife and the other has the worst firearm in the game to use against these armored adventurers who are wearing this armor that the adventure itself issued for them to have. So it's not like it wasn't expecting them to have this really high armor when this guy opened up on them with a shotgun. So Game Masters, you're going to want to organize this portion in a way that is easy for you to use in-game, and I suggest adding a couple more hijackers with some weaponry that could possibly touch the player characters. So I feel like we've got two halves of a really great adventure here, but no single great adventure. You know, not without putting some serious work into it. However, what they have here is just so damn good that I had to fill all the missing bits in myself because I wanted to run this. And I feel that Game Masters who do put that prep in are going to have a fantastic mini campaign out of this. You can find Search and Rescue in the Marches 1 through 5, available on the Mongoose Publishing website or on DriveThruRPG, links below. It is a good collection and I suggest checking it out. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews, RPG War stories, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, travelers, you have a great day. You know, those Tech Level 14 rescue suits and equipment were all pretty sweet. But the best part is, is how you spent that entire time just expecting them that they were going to file a report, how theirs was lost, or damaged, in the line of duty and needed to be replaced. And then, of course, they're going to stash the good rescue suit off in a footlocker somewhere and use that later on. But nah, they turned all those in and now they're just using their crappy regular suits for the rest of the campaign. Player characters, man. They will steal anything that is not nailed down. Unless, of course, you're expecting or wanting them to steal it, and that's when they get honest on you.